Good afternoon, everyone. You're all very welcome to our AWARE webinar today. Our topic this afternoon is managing mental illness in the workplace, a practical approach. So just as we're allowing people to join, I can give you a bit of information about AWARE and our webinar this afternoon. So as you know, our AWARE webinars take place on the second Wednesday of every month. Um, in terms of AWARE, for those of you who aren't familiar, we provide free support services and well-being programs for anyone impacted by anxiety, depression and bipolar disorder, and including those supporting a loved one. So we also have loads of information on mental health resources uh, available on our website on aware.ie. So do have a look there for more information. And before we begin our webinar today, uh, just to let you know, there'll be loads of opportunities to ask questions, which we will tackle towards the end of the webinar. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Um, obviously, we may not be able to speak directly to individual experience, but we'll try to answer the questions as much as we can. Um, unfortunately, we can't take questions after the webinar. But what we will do with the survey that goes out after the webinar is include a list of resources and links um, for more information. And we'll also include those resources in the notes under the YouTube recording that will go out later today. So just allowing people to join. And I'm delighted to introduce the panel this afternoon. So without further ado, we're joined by Jan McDonough, CEO at Open Door Initiative, Barbara Brennan, mental health advocate, and Angela Burke, career coach. So I'll ask you all if you're okay to introduce yourselves and just give a bit of an overview uh, in terms of the work that you do. Uh, Jan, I might start with you if that's okay. Sure, sure. Yeah, as you said, I'm the CEO of the Open Doors Initiative. And um, we reduce barriers for people from marginalized groups all marginalized groups to education, employment, and entrepreneurship. Um, we try to get them confident in work and help them into workplaces, to education, to starting their own business, whatever it is that appeals to you uh, in the best way possible. Great, thanks very much, Jan, and thanks for, for joining this afternoon. Uh, Angela, I might go to you next. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, yeah, so I'm Angela, I'm a career consultant um, at AngelaBurke.ie and I suppose what I'm passionate about and what I do is help people to, I suppose, navigate their career not only in alignment with their professional um, ambitions but also in alignment with their lifestyle needs um, and wants. So yeah, really chuffed to be able to support today. Thanks for joining Angela. And last but not least, Barbara, if you can introduce yourself and say a bit about what you do. Sure, absolutely. So I'm a mental health advocate. Um, I'm known as a stigma disruptor. Um, and um, I suppose my passion really is raising awareness around what mental health is, the difference between mental health and mental illness, and particularly helping people understand the impact of stigma. So stereotyping, prejudice, discrimination and that kind of thing. Um, I've run Sea Change, the National Stigma Reduction Programme for the last five years, and I've just left um, to start working in my own career um, and I've also just joined the Elephant in the Room movement which is um, an arts movement run by uh, Brent Pope looking at creating different conversations around stigma so I'm really interested in this conversation um, having led the workplace program for Sea Change for the last five years really important that we have these conversations because we spend so much of our time at work so I'm delighted to be part of the panel today and I'm really looking forward to a good discussion. Yeah that's great yeah thank you Barbara it's a really interesting initiative the the as you say, the elephant in the room, and and maybe that's maybe that maybe we might start there actually in terms of thinking about in work, um, and maybe starting with yourself there, Barbara, as you're saying about stigma. What are we what are we seeing in the workplace at the moment in terms of stigma, judgment around mental health? Well, I suppose firstly to understand when we're talking about stigma, what we're actually talking about. So we're talking about stereotyping. So this idea of hearing something and then making assumptions about somebody. So, uh, you know, if I say um, somebody has mental illness, I might jump to an image of somebody who has been unwell for a very long period of time, maybe is, is in hospital and happens to be on medication. That may be true for some people, but for a lot of people, it isn't. And so it's challenging that. Um, when we also look at that, we, we tend to 
to tie discrimination to it. And what we've seen a lot in the last number of years is that from a discriminatory perspective, discrimination is a lot um, is a lot different. It's not it's not as uh, overt now. So we're not as aware of the really big grand gesture saying you can't work here because you have this issue. It's a lot more covert, so hidden. Um, and actually a lot of people don't even realising that they're discriminating against other people for a lot of the time. So it's really about that nuanced piece. Um, from a judgment perspective, as you mentioned there, I think it's really important that we look at it. So firstly, there's the self-judgment that I judge myself. So if I've struggled with a mental health issue, how am I treating myself from a workplace perspective? Am I getting the right supports from it from a workplace perspective? Am I leaning into the employee assistance program? Am I getting the support of HR? Have I done additional training? Am I getting support from home? And then from, from the workplace, what we've been seeing, particularly in the last number of years, is um, a shift around understanding people's capacity. So historically, when we talked about um, mental health issues, we saw that everybody was um, thinking about mental illness and particularly around not understanding that people can and do recover and can hold down a full-time job. So it's about those kind of things, understanding that even if somebody has a disability physically or mentally, they still can work. And it's about how we how we work around that and looking at the awareness there. There's been a lot of research done in the last number of years around the world. And I've been working with the Global Anti-Stigma Alliance, looking at having these discussions. And um, there's also been an awful lot around psychosocial safety. So we're starting to hear those kind of terms in our workplaces, looking at what does that mean and how can we how can we tie in into that so for example and i've written this down so i always get the number wrong the iso 45003 um, it's a psychological health and safety uh, framework that's there and it's a free tool so it's those kind of things that we need to start leaning into to see how are we being the most supportive and how are we understanding things that we didn't know about before mm. yeah there's a lot in that isn't there as, as you say it's it's sort of moved from a very blatant sort of discrimination or stigma into much more nuanced understanding um, and understanding what might be a work in, in play there and, and I guess as you said the kind of the different resources and I guess there's also the the potential impact of that on people as well as, as we touched on isn't there um, and I guess maybe we might we might kind of talk around that a bit but I was just thinking about sort of I see you nodding a bit there Jan as well and just maybe coming to you in terms of what what you see in your in your work around that too and, and I guess when well, workplaces might be more inclusive you know yeah, on a personal level, I would mm. never work somewhere where I wasn't accepted or where there was stigma issues. And I've always, ever since I was diagnosed with um, dysphagalation many, many years ago, I'm that old, um, it was it was a lot more stigmatized, as, as Barbara pointed out, overtly. But I always made the decision right from the get go that I would treat it as any other illness. And that um, if I couldn't get a job because of my condition, it would not be a place I would want to be in and I would not thrive in and I would not be supported in. So I think it's it's really important to recognize the fact that you need good bosses, good colleagues, good friends, all those supports around you when you're in work. And I think that's something workplaces can really look to it's sort of creating an environment where everyone is welcome and, you know, reasonable accommodation is made for people with a variety of illnesses, not just mental health illnesses. And to really see that the workplace is going about to get knowledge about illness and to see how best they can support. And um, I think it, for me, I found it a very good distraction from my illness at the time. I was very immersed in my work. I knew if I was having a bad period that I could sense check my judgment with other people. And I think that's really important as well that you build up those supports around you, be it a mental health first aider, be it colleagues, be it your boss. Um, and I also found just having those supports in place meant I took far less time off and it impacted the illness less because there wasn't a source of stress trying to cover up or trying to be invisible or trying to um, pretend the whole time. I often say people with mental illness are the greatest actors. They all deserve Oscars because they're constantly 
covering up the illness and letting on it's not affecting them um, when it can be. And it can be so detrimental, obviously. Um, so I do think that's imp important to be able to vocalise it, to be able to seek help and to be in a workplace where it's not you're not looked down upon or seen as weak or whatever. But actually, the fact that you've overcome or, or are dealing with any illness you have and still presenting in work and there on merit and doing your best work. Uh, I think that's really important. And um, as I said at the start, I wouldn't work anywhere that didn't embrace all of that because work is such a vital part of your life and it is so all encompassing that if you're not happy there, if you're not able to bring your best person to it, um, it's not a happy place to be. Yeah, absolutely. I guess we spend so much time there, don't we? And as you say, there's, yeah, and as you say, there's, there's different tasks happening if you're struggling with mental health or or if work is creating mental health difficulties as well or, or feeding into that. It's both managing that and trying to, as you say, kind of negotiate the world of work with that and, and kind of managing two levels of it. It can be tricky enough. And as you say, there's certainly something about linking in for in the support for that. And also it sounds like maybe from, maybe we'll talk in a bit with Angela as well there but it sounds like workplaces are really kind of picking up the gauntlet a bit more and saying actually we have a responsibility here to be inclusive and to it sounds but from both of the work all the work that kind of is taking place it's it maybe this is just me but it, it feels like it's it's quite it's beyond just the ticking the box it's actually there's an appetite actually to ensure that people are well at work or to do to kind of sort of respond to those environments obviously nothing's perfect but but there's an appetite to be making some of those changes yeah and I guess maybe just thinking in from from you Angela I guess whether you any of that kind of resonates with what you see in terms of supporting people whether that's kind of managing yeah, it's I, 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 I feel myself nodding away um, yeah both Barbara um, and Jen were speaking there um just to come in on a, a point Jan that you made so um, I think employers are definitely they definitely want to help and I think the I suppose the focus and their heart is in the right place in terms of being more inclusive and accepting and supportive um, of what their employees need but a point I suppose two points I wanted to make one um, from I suppose an employee perspective and one from an employer perspective I think the one thing in all aspects of life we forget to do is sometimes ask so I think from an employee perspective not being afraid to I suppose tell their employee the employer and their manager what they need um, in order to feel supported in order to feel equipped to do their best work and I think from the employer perspective not be afraid I suppose to ask the question to employees whether it's at the interview stage or whether it's you know when when the employee is on board or when the employee has disclosed something not to be afraid just to say you know I haven't dealt with this before but I really want to support I'm so glad you felt comfortable enough to talk to me about this um because you know the disclosure is a massive thing for the employee and then just saying simply what can I do to help I think sometimes that can take such a huge weight off the employee's shoulders to feel heard and to feel supportive um but also it supports the employer because they're saying look I haven't dealt with this before but the you know their focus and their heart is in the right place and they want to help um the second thing I really wanted to say as well, um, and I have come across this a lot in the work I do with people, um, particularly as they're trying to find um, a new work environment. I think we all, <laughs> me included, have definitely found ourselves moving jobs at one stage, you know, sitting on the seat in the first day and thinking, oh, there's something quite not right here. This is not the job I signed up for, whether it's the work, the environment, the manager, whatever it is. And look, it's all learning at the end of the day. I always say these situations, they make it clear to us what we're not looking for um, and we what we what, what we actually are looking for. So they kind of serve as a compass. But there's actually a lot um, that people can do during the interview, during the recruitment process to suss out whether the environment is what it says it is on the chain, but also whether it's supportive and in alignment with what the, the candidate and the employee needs. Um, and I'm always surprised in workshops I deliver, you know, when I'm kind of working with people, I'm figuring out, well, what is it they actually need when it comes to changing a job? 
And people will often say, oh, well, I know what I need, but sure, how do I know that the organization or the team, you know, the environment is going to actually provide that until I'm in the door? And absolutely, you can never eliminate the risk 100%, but there is so much within the employee or the candidate's control that they can actually um, do during the recruitment process to suss out whether it feels right, whether it's in, align, in alignment with what they're looking for. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid. To, and I'm, I'm happy to share some of that if it's helpful as well. And um, so there were the two points initially that I really wanted to make, just not being afraid to ask, um, not being afraid to tell, uh, but also kind of using just some simple practical strategies to make sure you're kind of guiding yourself to an environment that's going to work best for you um, and allow you to succeed in your career. Yeah, yeah. yeah we um, we always yeah. suggest to all our companies that we work with that they, um, so firstly are very upfront about reasonable accommodations before the interview process, and also to have a passport um which travels with the person throughout their journey in the workplace world, says exactly to your point, Angela, what you need, what supports you need you choose who it goes to so you have full control you can if your manager changes you can choose to share it with your new manager so they're fully aware of what supports you need and it is becoming more popular as a tool for helping people within the workplace which i think is is really important and if companies are offering that up front you know they are open to working with you and supporting with you and it's definitely something to ask about in the interview process um, to ensure that those supports are in place and that the company is one that thinks that way as well. And Jan, sorry, is that so that's the passport is something that the person would do themselves in collaboration with the employer in terms of how it's shared, but they would kind of, yeah, the person would sort of come up with that themselves. They lead but... it. They lead <clears> of course. Yeah. The employer will offer it and okay. they will they will sort of to have a discussion with whoever yeah. their line manager is or a buddy or a mentor mm -hmm. and design it according to their needs. And okay. it's, it is gaining more traction, um, yeah. which is wonderful to see. Yeah, no, that's great. I guess it, it kind of highlights, doesn't it, um, as we're saying, Angela, there, like the person has a lot in their control, but I guess you're also, you're kind of, we forget that, don't we, when we're in the interview process, that we're also interviewing the employer in a way. Um, and, and I guess that the kind of passport idea speaks to this idea that we also want to see that the employer is, so, so there is an onus on them, isn't there, to um, enforce the law or kind of not enforce the law, but I guess to work within employment legislation and offer something concrete there. It's not just sort of fluffy. If we get to that, that's great. But if we don't, sure, look. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's a responsibility, isn't there? I don't know, Barbara, if you want to come in there on, on, on that. Yeah, and I suppose it's, it's twofold. So from an employee perspective, to understand that when we're talking about mental health in the workplace and we're talking about disability in the workplace, both of those are covered by law. So from a point of view of um, disability and, you know, um, the nine grounds of discrimination, and then also from a health and safety perspective, all of those things are there. So from an absolute baseline perspective, even if I was to say, you know what, I would love to be able to share with this company whether I'm already in the door and I'm already working with them or I'm starting, but I'm not sure what their culture is and I'm not sure if it's if it's safe for me yet to do that or maybe I haven't connected with the right person. So, you know, being clear about who you share your personal details with is really important. But from that perspective, it is absolutely possible for you to ask for reasonable accommodation and not necessarily disclose what the issue is. So, for example, what we've seen a lot around mental health difficulties is that people are asking for reasonable accommodations around maybe attending um, appointments or needing to shift um, time patterns, um, particularly if you have somebody who um, they have a particular schedule that they need to keep or maybe they're using medication and it's impacting their um, how they sleep and those kind of things. So some of those reasonable accommodations can be put in place without disclosing. And I think this is one of the challenges for a lot of workplaces that um, what I've seen is that a lot of organizations, they, they are in that space where they say, well, you need to tell us what it is that you need help with, which actually you don't. Because here's the thing, if I'm saying I need help because I've got um, a child at home who's sick, because I've broken my leg, because I've got COVID, because I've got cancer, because I've got uh, heart pro problems or because I've got mental illness is irrelevant. The help and support should be there regardless. 
And the thing is that generally speaking, when we have a good experience and we know that we're being supported, we're much more likely to actually go and disclose and say, you know what, I've had a good experience now and I feel comfortable. And particularly the piece about research and, and like that, um, you're selling yourself, but they're also selling themselves to try and find out from other people who work there what the culture is like so that you can balance the idea of how safe it is for you to share that personal information, how practical it is and the, the impact that it's going to have if it's going to be positive negative or neutral so i think it's really important that we we understand that there are laws there and there are pieces around um health and safety and disability support but also from a perspective of understanding the piece about disclosure and how we can support each other around that mm. and also it's important to remember we're at nearly full employment so mm. you're in control you can choose who you work for um, and do that research, as Barbara and Angela said, and find out about the company. But companies are crying out for people who are good, who are there to advance their interests. But it is a two way street and there's a lot more choice in the market because, I mean, any type of job there, there is a real shortage of people to fill roles. So it's a very good time to be looking for work and to be particular about where you work based on the comments just made. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. Um, and I guess that's sort of the, the kind of the input in work. And I, I don't know, as we kind of before we, as it might kind of lead into that kind of coming back into work um, sort of returning to work and the issues that might come up there. Um, but I, before we leave that, I wonder, Angela, if you wanted to add anything in there in terms of what we are talking about, or we're maybe even starting to think about getting into work. Uh, or returning to work or, or changing jobs? Yeah, I think with returning to work, um, you know, regardless of the reason um, for being out of work, there's a lot of uh, anxiety and fear of the unknown, um, anticipation that comes with that. Um, so I suppose I always say there's a few practical things that you can do that will just, I suppose, support you with that transition. And it can be anything from, you know, if you're going back into the same job, for example, or the same organization as before, it could be just a case, you know, of picking up the phone to someone you were friendly with in there um, and maybe meeting them one-on-one -on -one first. Maybe that's, you know, three weeks out, three months out. I don't know, everyone's timeline will differ, but just, you know, just having that friendly face to meet with and maybe to discuss what has changed since you've been in there. Um, maybe there's been some team changes. Maybe there's been some kind of changes in the work, etc. But even just, you know, sitting down, having a coffee with that person, that will take such a weight off your shoulders. You'll feel that kind of sense of connection. Um, and if they're a good person that you're meeting with, maybe they could then arrange for you to meet with maybe a couple more. So that person plus maybe two or three additional colleagues. And that could include one new colleague that colleague that's come on board since um, you've been out or, you know, two others. But just I suppose slowly building up that kind of interaction and um, other things like, you know, regardless of why we've been off, you know, if I think of times in my own career where you know I've taken a month off to go traveling and I come back I had those back to school nerves where I'm thinking oh my gosh what's my past my password what do I do you know um so couple that with you know a really challenging time and maybe an extended period of time and the worry about the stigma and having to explain yourself and all of that that comes with it it's really tough um so maybe even little things like trying to refresh your memory on your industry knowledge uh, because you might you know I think out of sight out of mind sometimes we, we don't think about work and if you're dealing with a mental illness you're going to be focusing on your recovery and work is the last thing you're going to be thinking about so even just trying to brush up your knowledge um, about your industry, what's been going on since you've been off, just getting used to the lingo again. Um, so reading articles, watching videos, that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, some organizations may have a phased approach that might be a formal process they have, or maybe it's not a formal process, but again, maybe that comes to having a chat with your boss um, and just, or HR and just explaining, you know, for me, I think going back two days a week or <clears throat> three days a week or half days or something like that might just help with that transition rather than going full blown kind of five days a week. Yeah. Um, so there's so many little things there, just a couple of, 
you know, a myriad of things that you can do, but it's those small little things that will really help when it comes to just supporting yourself as much as possible. And I suppose the last thing I would say is sometimes, you know, we need to be like, what, what kind of, I suppose, what support one person needs will completely differ to another person. So it's kind of sitting with yourself, I think, before you do chat with the employer, whether that's a new employer, an old employer, et cetera, and just figuring out, well, what would actually support me? So that when you do have that conversation, if you do have that conversation, you're, you know exactly what you need and you feel more in control of the conversation. If you're not, um, you know, if they're, if they're if you don't feel comfortable disclosing, and um, you know, maybe that's not somewhere you can you can go, whether it's a new or an existing employer. Um, just getting clear as well what you need and what the narrative is around that, because at the end of the day, um, you know, our story is our story, and I think it's important to know that it's your story to be told how you want it to be told, um, to who you want it or who, who you don't want to share it with. So I think just putting yourself in that position of power um yeah knowing what you need and then kind of I suppose figuring out whether how you want to say or how you want to describe what you need yeah hmm. excuse me thanks Angela that's that's really helpful and I guess that's a big sort of topic isn't it the returning to work or maybe switching jobs or or getting into work after kind of not having been in work for a while for whatever reason maybe um and I guess maybe if we open up that sort of theme and maybe maybe sort of kind of coming back to you there, Jan, in terms of the work that you might do um, and what you've seen in that respect, certainly supporting marginalized groups. And yeah, yeah, it's different for everyone. And, yeah. you know, you can have a lot of intersectionality, for example, a, a refugee with mental health difficulties and the double barriers triple barriers, whatever it may be that they face um, in terms of, of going to work in the first place in a new country, in a new language, different work culture, um, you know, costs that are associated with it, all, all of those kind of things. So it can be difficult to navigate. But I suppose what you have to think of at the end of the day is a lot of this is internal to you, the stress, the anxiety, the worry. And we try to help them verbalize what they're worried about and explain the best way and the best path for them. But we do it twofold. We do it with the employers as well. So we try to explain to employers, you know, this person may be facing difficulties in X, Y and Z. One thing we do advocate for is a buddy because or a mentor or someone who can support the person, especially in the, the initial few days and weeks. And there might be something they that is really stressing them that they don't feel comfortable saying directly to their boss or line manager, but they will have a conversation with the buddy about it. And we find that to be a really good way of, of getting people comfortable in a work environment either as a returner or as someone starting off or whatever it may be. And also you've got to remember you're there for a reason. You've been employed because you have the skills. You're there on merit. So it's for you to let that shine and let all the, the, the problems you see building up around it, deal with them one by one, get help dealing with them, get professional help, be it through open doors or through someone like Angela or through someone like Barbara, you know, get get resources in around you. Talk to your friends, talk to people who are in the workplace. How does that work? What happens if this happens? You know, try and remove all those fears in advance of going into them or if they come up while you're in the process, talk to someone. I really can't emphasize that enough. Because when you keep it all internalized and it builds up and up and up in your head, that's when, you know, you might feel you've said the wrong thing or done the wrong thing. And it can often be a very, very minor matter. And it's just a matter of explaining yourself or explaining the situation or I'm having a really bad day and it's all a bit too much for me. And, you know, people will help you find solutions because I think the vast majority of people want to help. They really want to empathize and, you know, 
make it better for the person and for the individual. And I, I think that's really key. So yeah, seek out your supports, seek out what makes you work, makes it work best for you. And um, you look back in a month, two months, three months and say, why was I so worried about something so minor? You know, it's so big at the time. And that when you look back at it, half the time you don't even remember. You, you know, it's it doesn't even occur to you because you're in the system, you're back in work, you're used to all the processes, the work culture and so on. And um, so I, I, I think try and break them down into small chunks and get help with them and yeah. support yourself with resources that work for you. Yeah. And as you say, and as you say, Jan, really importantly, remember that you were re recruited there or appointed there for a reason. Aside from any of our discussion, like you were coming with your skills and your experience and you're there because of that. Um, yeah. so it's, and I guess certainly in kind of feeling depressed or, or anxious that can sort of erode confidence can't it or our self-belief so that as you say to really kind of connecting out so that's probably the case anyway generally isn't it to, to kind of get a, a second sort of actually my is is how I'm kind of looking at this you know what what's your view of it or getting that support is really helpful isn't it across the board so and I wonder Barbara just bringing you in there if that kind of chimes with what you see in your experience or Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the more empowered that we are, the easier this gets. And I say empowered coming from a place of being there now. It doesn't feel very empowering when somebody's saying, oh, but you can do that yourself if you're in a space of struggle, if you're in a space of, but I don't know where to get that information. Or I've never done this before. It can be very scary. So really the advice that the, the girls are saying about get that support and don't be alone in doing it. There is lots out there to help you. And the, the more you do it, the easier it gets. The other thing is to flip it and put it from a workplace perspective. There's so many organizations that are really trying to do the right thing. And for a lot of time, it's not about trying to reinvent the wheel. So actually, if we're thinking about a return to work policy or a return to work process, because actually it's not so much about the policy, but the procedure, because quite often organizations have these gorgeous big policies, but they're not live. And so the idea of the procedural side of it. So, for example, the things that Angela was talking about, like, you know, having somebody meet you or having that plan in place. If we were to actually say, well, what's the policy around pregnancy and maternity leave? What do we do we sit and we talk to these people and we say what suits you you know are you breastfeeding right now are you able to come into the office do you want to work from home what days suit you so we have a conversation and I think that's something that when we're talking about having discussions around coming back into work or starting work organizations can be more supportive by looking at what are we doing in other policies and how do we implement them and then literally just writing down the practical stuff because the thing is common sense isn't common practice so quite often it is the thing that we all know it's the right thing but as soon as we start asking ourselves oh is that the right thing or should I do that or is somebody else doing it we automatically put ourselves on the back foot and then start panicking and from a workplace perspective when we start then thinking about the legal side of things and if I do this what then and you know or what about if an organization is very small and they can't support a reasonable accommodation request it's about having a really open discussion with that person and explaining why the reasonable accommodation can't be met and maybe what else could be done instead and also signposting to other places because a lot of times what I've seen is organizations who can't put the accommodation in place they work with other organizations to to have that kind of support and that that cushion so it's really important for us as individuals going into those spaces to be aware of if i have a um a disability or if i need particular support what are the kind of things that would help me? Because I'm the expert on me. Nobody is going to know me better. Even if I go to a disability support service, they will know lots about the thing generally. But what I need, I know better. And that's the same for everybody. So if we go into a workplace with that in mind and even be able to say, well, I'd love to look at your mental health policy, but the procedural side to see if that fits me and how I how I function. We've also seen a lot in the last couple of years around um, ADHD and and different uh, neurodiversity and the different supports that are being put in place there, it's exactly the same conversation. So it's about finding out 
from a workplace perspective, what are we doing that's already working that we can just replicate? What do we do to make it easy? And particularly, how do we communicate with our with our staff and say, well, what are we doing that's right? What could we do to make it better? So a lot of the times when I've worked with organizations, a lot of the best ideas actually come from people who say, well, I've experienced this or I live with somebody who experiences this and this is what helps them. So asking those questions, as we've already heard, is so powerful. It's huge, isn't it? And I guess the it's really helpful to, yeah, as you said, it's to having those conversations, which, I mean, the work that all three of you are doing is is really phenomenal, actually, because it's really moved things along, hasn't it? I've been thinking about 10 or 20 years, the idea maybe of, of saying, actually, I'm someone who experiences X or Y, and, and this is what I need here. That's huge, you know, and it, so it takes a lot, as you said, kind of there's definitely there's support in that, but even the fact that there's a platform for these conversations to be happening is 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 really evolving, isn't it? And that's really important to take away, if, especially if someone's been out of work for quite a while. Like it's it's quite an environment now that says actually we have obligations and duties here as an employer, um, and also that there's permission, which is kind of counter to the shame and stigma that can sometimes be present in mental health of saying actually this is something I struggle with and I'm going to need this. You know, and I was just thinking there about the appointments. I think someone had mentioned and that's, you know, not being able to take time off for appointments is another tricky area, isn't it? So these are all about look, these are valid needs. You know, if if, if you have a, something that needs to be have an appointment for, then that's that's valid to be able to, to take that time. So I guess it's kind of negotiating that and, and knowing what's sort of within the legal requirements, isn't it? Um, there's there's a fair few questions coming in. So I don't know before we move to the questions, if I don't want to put any of you on the spot here because I guess there, it's kind of large topics but if there's anything that you feel that you you we haven't said before we get to the questions um I would say to sort of come in now um maybe just a practical piece around yeah. the first, um topic we touched on which is kind of the in work and what can mm. support but I would see a lot of um a lot of people you know wh whether there's a mental illness involved or, or not actually just really struggling with overwhelm in work um and that can be overwhelmed when it comes to the sheer volume of workload that people are working with um you know the anticipation and anxiety that comes with working on certain projects and that kind of stretch zone in your career um but also something simple like you know, if you're struggling with um, a mental illness and you get an email that, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, from your manager, um, you know, scheduling a chat for two days time, like your mind, I think the best of us, our mind can can wander and think, oh, my gosh, like <laughs> there's no agenda. What do they want to talk about? So something I actually advised um, uh, a client recently in a workshop was, you know, don't be afraid to like say to your boss like that and you can make humor out of it if, if you feel better but just she's like you know that email it really worried me like I didn't you know I didn't know what to expect or if you want to take a more kind of formal approach you could just say you know if you're scheduling a meeting with me um would you mind just excuse me I'm trying to get rid of a cough at the moment um would you mind just you know putting in an agenda or a vague idea of what we might discuss or you know if if, if that even feels too much for you because I know it will for some people even just responding each time you know you get an invite like that and just saying sure um you know what what would you like to discuss so that I can come prepared and if you do that enough times your manager will start to see the trend and they will maybe preempt that and actually come with an agenda so small things like that and then the other thing I wanted to mention that I think would be quite helpful for, for people is how you approach your workload and um, on a Monday and a Friday and on on each morning of the week can actually have a huge impact on how the rest of the day goes so I always say you know working off most of us will probably have 20 30 things <clears throat> on our to-do list that we need to work through but that is terrifying um so I always say on a Friday evening before you down tools for the weekend if you can look ahead at your week and see what's coming up what are the priorities but also look at what you didn't get to this week and then just jot down for Monday morning your top three priorities so for the whole day on Monday you can have your whatever it is your six things you want to get through um or you're going to aim to get through but I I, I suppose identify the three that you really need to get through pop them in your calendar if that's how you work I know that won't be the case for everyone but at least that way that it kind of I suppose prevents the Sunday night fear because on Sunday you remember okay I'm sorted like I, I know what I'm 
going into a Monday morning, have my priorities set. Um, and also on Friday, if you can close off anything that's been kind of lingering around for a while, any of those emails you need to respond to that typically you don't know what to do, um, try and just get those closed off so that you know you're kind of going on into Monday with a fresh slate um, and you know what's ahead of you. And then if you carry on that practice each evening, closing off what you can close off within the day so that you don't have to bring it forward to the next day. And then also just identifying what are my priorities for tomorrow so that each morning you know what you're kind of going into. There'll always be curveballs, that's life, but you it just helps you to kind of take control um, of your day. So I could, I could talk about this for hours, but hopefully those few little tips can help when it comes to overwhelm. Um, and they can help on motivation as well, because <laughs> have set what you're going to do you can also try and put little bits of accountability whether it's pop in you know if you're working on a big project pop in um maybe an update meeting with your stakeholders or your manager for two weeks time and that way you know okay i have to actually get stuff done in the next two weeks you can't go to the meeting without um things in place so yeah just those few yeah. little bits i think will help with overwhelm yeah. motivation yeah, no, that's great. Thank you, Angela. It's really helpful, actually, to, yeah, the kind of concrete tips. And, and just thinking in about some of the questions that are coming in, um, there's a fair few maybe about, I guess, maybe EAP kind of being palmed off as, as kind of maybe one aspect of it or maybe box ticking that are coming through. And I'm going to read out some of this this question that's come in from someone because I think it kind of exemplifies some of the issues that might come up maybe. Um, I've experienced assumptions around my capability, having disclosed mental health difficulties, projects taken off my plate without consulting me. Um, difficult to advocate for myself now to manage that side of things um, without triggering a lot of stigma. And I guess this idea that similar things happen to, to many people. And I guess the, the kind of question more broadly for that is how to get, and we're touching on it a little bit, but I think it comes up in terms of the reality well, as well of how to kind of, get employers to take responsibility for the role they play but but I guess crucially in consultation and I think that might speak a bit to what maybe we were talking about before about the person knowing what they need so it's it's quite disempowering isn't it if you're not part of that conversation mm -hmm. so I don't know if, if maybe who wants to take that one I guess the um, employers I might did... jump in about yeah. the stigma piece just to start sure. and I think I think that might be a really good fit for um for yeah. Jean afterwards now not not um not putting words in your mouth but um particularly and it's a really really good point because this is the thing about stigma that a lot of the time quite often what we've seen in workplaces is exactly that that somebody will say well do you know what we know that Barbara had um, an issue with her mental health previously and we have this really big project coming up and it's going to be really stressful it's going to be a really big workload and we don't want to put pressure on her so we won't give her the project that's being done to me, not with me. So it's exactly that. Now, I'm not saying that that is the case for this person, but more often than not, decisions are made to be supportive, but they're not done in a consultative and collaborative way. And a lot of times for people with disabilities or for people who identify as other in whatever way, it is up to us to actually show people what we need and what we want, which isn't right. However, we are in a society and in a world where until other people start understanding what we need, it is going to continue to be that way. So unfortunately, it is a position where we need to say, OK, I've experienced this. I need to take this further. So it, it is a little bit like looking at what all your options are. And sometimes doing nothing is an option. It doesn't feel like a very nice option, but we need to even write down what are the 10 things I can do so I can do nothing. Um, I can do nothing and feel bad about it. I can feel bad about it, but maybe consider doing something. I don't know what I'm going to do. So maybe one of my actions is to find out who else I could talk to. Maybe I could go and speak to my um, my my direct boss. Maybe I could write it down. Maybe I could send an email to HR. So it's about actually planning it out. And a little bit like what Angela was saying, break it down into tiny steps and say, these are the things I can do. And then go back and review and say, does that feel like it fits for me? So if I say I, I'm not going to do anything about that, how do I, how am I going to feel about that? Or if I say, well, I'm going to go and talk to my manager, do I feel I can actually follow that through? Or is that the right person for me? So sometimes identifying the action and then identifying the person that you need to support you with it or who you're going to talk to is a really big part of it because maybe your manager is part of the issue or maybe your manager is the one who's going to champion you. So the thing is that until we start having these discussions in our workplaces and saying, you know, 
I'm not sure what the intention was behind this, but I'd like to I'd like to look at this so the next time we could approach it differently. I you know maybe I would maybe I would have said no to doing the work anyway, but I would have liked to have been part of that process and I would have liked to consult about it. Or maybe there was an element of that piece of work that I could have done. So I think it's important when we're looking at that that we do see what steps we can take. So again, that empowerment piece so that we can make our own decisions about it and also flagging it with our with our organization because it is that stigma piece that you know they don't want to do the wrong thing, but also they don't want to make things worse if, if they know that somebody has experienced a mental health difficulty. And quite often it's the lack of conversation is what stigma is because stigma is silence. So it really is important that we address that piece from a perspective of organizations that if you're in a management position or you're in an employer position to really understand the impact of you making a decision on your employee's behalf, what that feels like and the exclusion that they go through. And then that whole discussion of, am I good enough? Second guessing and, you know, even maybe feeling like gaslighting is going on and that kind of thing. So it's really important that we look at the impact of those decisions and is it that well we need to have an uncomfortable uncomfortable discussion to move through that or is it that well no actually we're doing this because x y and z happened before and this is a proven case so it's about really starting to work together and question just because it was done like this before doesn't mean it's the right way to do it now yeah that's great thank you barbara and john do you want to well, just to say, yeah, and on the flip side of that, absolutely, totally agree with every bar everything Barbara said. Sometimes I find, for me personally, I'm so in my own head about, oh, it's because I have X or because I have Y, and it's nothing to do with that. It is absolutely nothing. It is a business reason, or someone else has put their hand up and said, I'll take that, or whatever. So I think it is in business you need to sometimes go outside your comfort zone and have what for you might be a very uncomfortable conversation initially, but actually turns out to be kind of a hill of beans because, oh, I didn't realize, sorry. um Yeah, no problem. It's nothing to do with X, it's Y. So sometimes that can be a reason as well. And I know it sounds easy to say because we all live to a vast degree in our own heads. And if you have mental health difficulties, sometimes that can be the reason for everything. And it's not necessarily, um, but also to push past it and open up. And you can do it very gently and very carefully and just say, look, that made me feel, you know, upset or, you know, put to one side. Is it because, and just open the conversation and most people, you'll be amazed once you open the conversation, they're going, not at all, not what I meant. That was not my intention. And that can be a good way. And even if they turn around and say, yes, it's because we don't think you're up to the task. I mean, I don't know what it's like for everyone, but I find stress, the task is not the problem. It's the aftermath. And maybe even explaining that to your boss or the person leading out on a project, it's good. I might need to take some time off or down tools a little after the project, but the project itself, I'm all over. I can handle. This is nothing to me. Um, so just be very clear, as you mentioned, Barbara, about you know what what your effect is and how you are what you are bringing to something and how it affects you, and then you know, complete that circle by telling the person who's outside you and has no idea what you're thinking or feeling or your abilities, exactly what they are. And that's the past what I was talking about earlier is very helpful in that because it delineates everything and sort of says, you know, this, if this happens, that might trigger me. Or if this happens, that might have an effect on my mental health or whatever it may be. Um, so people are aware and people know what your capabilities are, your true capabilities. Yeah. And and John, just as we're on you, there was a question in there about whether Open Doors supports uh, people in the West of Ireland. That might be an easy answer. Or we not. do. We yeah. do. We're, we're fully remote. So we have yeah. people all over the country. And um, most of our work is online. Uh, we have right. in facilities as well, but we can support anywhere. Yeah. Brilliant. That's no OK. 
And and Barbara, there was a specific one there about what you had mentioned, the psychological safety, the ISO. I don't know if you could say a little bit, maybe briefly there again. Yeah. So basically, when we're talking about psychological safety, it's the, the bit about how do I feel and, and the impact of my work. So, for example, when we're thinking about, um, and I actually, because I saw that, so I actually wrote, wrote myself a couple of notes. Um, so the kind of things when we're talking about these standards and how we're assessing this risk is things like excessive workload, stress-related um, work issues, um, conflicting demands, when we're looking at the way the control of my workload so for example it might be um that you know i have a really big workload in a particular week and in order for me to manage it i need to split my day so i'm taking different breaks and maybe i need to change my working hours or maybe it's that i need to go back and actually flag it with my employer and say this workload isn't possible within my time so there were certain things there um so the iso standards really um it's a european um survey and a Euro european tool so so it really is looking at how organizations can understand more about what that psychological safety is and how to mitigate risk. So it's about doing things like, like looking at workload and saying, is the workload that we're expecting reasonable for this particular role? If it isn't, what can we do to mitigate it? You know, are there other factors? So for example, you know, we've all just come out of a pandemic. When we went into the pandemic, one of the things that I looked at within my own team was the psychological risk of my team then being isolated, that we went from being in an office environment to people being isolated in their homes, maybe working from the end of their bed, um, you know, the fear that people had around the disease itself and the impact of all of that, and, and then not being able to talk with people around how they were feeling emotionally. So it's really about looking at what supports are in place but particularly some of the tools that we can use. Um, I also wanted to flag one or two others, if that's okay, just in relation to okay. some of the frameworks. So you've got um, Healthy Ireland framework. Um, you've also got um, Mental Health Ireland have just launched um, in the in the last year, they've just launched um, a framework as well and that's supported by the government. IBEC do an awful lot around workplace um, initiatives. Um, they would have a lot of information around this. Um, there was a question also around um, disclosing a mental health issue. And I was starting to type that in, but again, going to IREC. So that's the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, IHREC, um, and looking at um, reasonable accommodations there. Um, and then also places like Workplace Wellbeing Ireland, they do a lot of training and have a lot of resources, but there's a lot of free stuff that's available for organizations and for individuals. So the thing is, what I would also say is, don't bog, get bogged down by taking on too much. If you're an individual who wants to find out this way and wants to be empowered and wants to do all these things, absolutely brilliant. But also be careful of going the opposite way and taking on way too much and getting bogged down. It's why there are specialists in these areas. And the other thing I would absolutely say is the like of the Citizen Information Service are phenomenal. They are really supportive. Um, FLAC, the Fleet Free Legal Aid, um, are really, really good. And the Workplace Commission as well, um, the WRC, they are absolutely phenomenal at supporting people who are experiencing difficulties or who need support. So it's really important that while you are in the process of empowering and learning and building that process for yourself, that you get the help of people who are already in those spaces. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you, all of you. Um, and I guess as we're talking, I'm aware we're not going to get to everyone's questions. So really helpful links there, Barbara. And as I was saying uh, at the beginning, we'll certainly send out a lot more resources um, with the notes for this webinar. And maybe just kind of coming to another couple of questions. And maybe, Angela, there might be, not to put you on the spot, but maybe some for you or maybe all three of you thinking about, I guess, just this kind of practical things around whether it's anxiety or low mood that gets that might be impacting kind of sleep and, and that having a knock on effect on kind of the work that you're doing or things may be taking longer or what we're all it maybe often it can happen is sort of maybe overthinking in the role or or kind of performance and not necessarily the mental health side of it but I guess the, the practical things maybe that that can be helpful there um Just to jump in, um, yeah. in terms of um, kind of from a work perspective, this is something you can, I suppose, suss out as well if you are in the recruitment process or if you're going to be in the re recruitment process soon. But some organizations are more flexible than others in terms of they're very supportive um, for the employee to do the work when they work best and how they work best. Um, others then maybe not so much, but maybe because they're, you know, constrained 
with regard to the type of work that's carried out, right? Sure, they're not set up for that. But if that is something that's quite important to you, if, for example, you know that you're more of a, um, I was going to say an, an night owl, but more of an after, if you work best in the afternoon, for example, and you're not great with the early starts, um, I think you mentioned uh, a lack of sleep. So if you know that's going to be the case, then maybe when you're going through the recruitment process, top of mind for you is an organization that will actually enable you to work when you work best. Um, that naturally is going to definitely make the, smooth, the pool a bit smaller. But if that's something that's really important to you that, and you know you're going to do your best work, then you're setting up yourself for success, but also you know your employer. Um, so that's just something worth mentioning there. Um, and even if you are already in a workplace, again, <clears throat> I feel like it's kind of been a bit of the theme of today's chat, hasn't it? But about just having the conversation, it's not always going to go in your favor. It's not always going to be a yes. But if you feel comfortable and empowered to do so, just having the conversation about what works best for you, you know, um, if you can't change your hours or if you can't find a job where, you know, your your hours um, can be adjusted, maybe it's a case of figuring out what work is best to do when you're maybe not in your uh, most productive mood so maybe there's something that's a little bit kind of um repetitive something quite easy that you'd kind of do in your sleep um and then for the time where you know you work best maybe that's after lunch for example leaving the more strategic um tackling work for that time thank you, thank you. just on that as well one well two things Andrew you referred earlier to plotting out your diary and, you know, putting in places where you're prepared for the week. Also put in thinking time, give yourself mental space. Um, I did work with a, a, a sort of business coach and that was one thing she always said to me, she goes, you can't be going full tilt the whole time. People go in waves and to put in thinking time at least once a week where you just free think or not think or, you know, just have space. And also very key, uh, and I find so, so helpful is if you can just get out for a walk, just go for a walk either before you start work at your break. If you're about to do a seminar like this with hundreds of people, which is really terrifying, whatever it may be, just do a bit of exercise. It raises your endorphins. It just puts your head in a better place. And, a, you know, just a quick walk will, will make a world of difference or any exercise, whatever you're into yourself. Um, I really find that to be helpful um, just within the working day. Or if there's something you want to think out, you know, go for a walk. Don't think about it. It'll come to you. But you're just giving yourself headspace the whole time. Yeah, no, really, really helpful, Jan. Thank you, and 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 really key. And but and I'm sad to say we're we're fast coming to the end of of our time together today. But certainly the resources will will kind of come out, as I said in the notes. Now, I think well, I'll get I'll get to the, our next webinar next month in terms of um our mental health week. But I I wanted maybe to if we were to be really really brief, we've probably got about ten or twenty seconds each just to I guess to end on a note for for each of you what you think is kind of the most important thing that you that you would hope someone might take away from them from this webinar even in a couple of words so I'll I'll really beg you for brevity but 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 something maybe from each of you maybe um Angela if I start with you yeah um just have the conversations I say for both yeah. sides please and thank you and Jan um, your mind is a really powerful foe and a great ally and just look after it. It's a muscle. It needs rest. Brilliant. Thank you. And Barbara? For me, it's social connection. So whether you're a manager supporting diverse teams and you don't know what to do, asking other team members or asking other um, managers what they do, or even having that downtime that the, that the guys have talked about, taking that break, connecting with people. I think social connection just it changes everything. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you all for your for your time this afternoon. And we've had a yeah, huge amount of questions on the the information and expertise that you've given has been really brilliant, all three of you. So thank you for contributing today. Um 
and moving on to our webinar for next month then. So that is part of our Aware Mental Health Week. So it's depression across the lifespan. Uh, really hope many of you can join there again. And certainly as we come to the end of the webinar today, we'll do a survey just asking people how they found it. So please do kind of give us your feedback on that. So just to say again, thank you all for joining. Thank you to the wonderful panel, all the information that you've given and hopefully see many of you next month. Thank you.